Hello everyone. Welcome to our presentation on complex systems thinking. How to change the way we think about problem solving. Well, why talk about complex systems thinking? Well, I think one of the key things we have is we know the world is full of systems and we know many of those systems are complex, whether it's the environment, whether it's ecology, whether it's the economy. Um, we know these systems are complex systems. And the interesting thing is that while we know these are complex systems, many of us don't are not really familiar with complex systems thinking. So this is what this presentation is all about. Because one of the interesting things is, many of us, particularly if you come from a scientific background, but as we'll cover, even if you come from a general background, we tend to approach systems from a problematic dimension. Now, the, the way we tend to approach thinking about systems and solving problems with systems is we come at it from a Newtonian perspective. And I think this quote here from Alexander Pope really just sums up how we see the world. You know, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. You know, Newton had a profound impact in how we think about science and particularly the natural world. And what he taught us was that we could, if we could work out how systems worked and if we worked out how things worked and we worked out their initial conditions, we could build models of them and we could predict what would happen. The problem with this sort of thinking though is, and it's come way outside science into management theory and a whole other range of, of areas, is that it's not that well equipped when you come to certain systems, particularly complex systems. And the reason it's not that well equipped is it focuses on the components of systems. It says if you break systems down to their individual components and understand those com those individual components, you understand the system as a whole. But as a, a really neat example of why this is not always the case, have a look at an ant. We can take an individual ant and we can study that ant as much as we want, but it doesn't actually tell us that much about the ant colony and the way that ant colony behaves. So this presentation is really all about how do you think about systems and how do we change our thinking from a Newtonian way of thinking about systems to a more complex systems thinking approach. Now the area of complex systems it has been tackled by a whole different range of, of disciplines and there are many different ways we could do a presentation on complexity and complexity science. We could approach it from an economic perspective, a scientific perspective, an engineering perspective, biology, chemistry, all of those areas. So there's a number of different ways we could tackle it. And then certainly if you watch other videos, you'll see lots of different ways. The way we're going to tackle it is in from a sense of modeling. I think as an engineer who builds models, I find the world a lot easier to imagine and understand if I can model it. So we're definitely going to tackle the problem of complexity from a systems, uh, from a modeling approach. So with that in mind, and bearing in mind that the subject of complexity science is massive, we're only going to really look at the tip of the iceberg here today. But, and we're really only trying to say there are different ways to think about systems, and taking a complex systems approach is the, the remedy, and it's the solution for getting over the limitations of a Newtonian view of the world. So with that in mind, let's go to Boston in 1971. Let's go to the Massachusetts General Hospital. Let's go to the sixth floor of that hospital and let's meet Chris Langton. Now, Chris Langton is debugging code on the psychology department's new computer. He's essentially recutting the code so it'll run on the new computer it used to run on the old one. It's 3 a.m. It's the middle of winter. That's when Chris Langton likes to work in the middle of the night. And to amuse himself when he's doing this debugging of this code, what he sometimes does is he puts on something called the game of life. Now, the game of life is a game that was invented two years uh, previously by an English mathematician. And what it is, is it's a computer program that you run and it shows cells that are alive or dead. And there's various rules these cells uh, run by, which we'll come back to later. But the interesting thing is when you put this on, and Chris Langton would have had to grab the tapes to put this on, it creates these interesting patterns. Now there's obviously a lot of uh, randomness going on here. But when you watch this for a while, you'll start to see different patterns and motifs appear and disappear. You'll see areas of this which are 
look quite static. They're not changing, and then suddenly uh, another piece of the game of life will move into it, and it'll disrupt it and change it, and you'll get different things. And I mean, this is an interesting thing to look at in the middle of the night when you're debugging code. And as Chris Langton is sitting there doing that, he suddenly feels the presence of someone else in the room with him. He turns around to check who it is, and he realizes there's no one there. It's 3 a.m., and he's still alone. He goes back to looking at his code. He glances back up at the game of life, and he realizes, and he said his hair, the hair stood up at the back of his neck, he realizes the presence he felt in the room is actually the game of life. Because there's something about watching this that appears lifelike. There's something about this that looks like it's similar to what we see in real life. Because we see order and patterns in real life that sometimes defy what we think we're going to find. Many times we, we expect disorder and we don't see that. And we expect randomness and we don't see that. For example, here's a really good example from nature that you'll be familiar with, which is starlings flying. And like a lot of different birds, they form into these incredible patterns in the sky. And the question is, how do they do this? Where is this order coming from? Is it because there's one bird who's in charge of all the other birds and, and dictating where they're going? Or is there no boss board, so to speak? Is there, can each bird just actually see the entire collection of birds? And is it part of this big you know, choreographed dance? Or is there something else going on in here? Where is this pattern and where is this order coming from? And we see this in various other aspects of, of nature. Let's look at the, the metabolic rate of animals versus their body size. Now just bear with me on this little, little journey. What we've got on this graph here along the vertical line, we've got the, the metabolic rate um, per kilogram of animal, and along the bottom uh, horizontal axis, we've got the body mass in kilograms. And what you see on the top left-hand corner of this graph is you see the shrew um, has got um, uh, a certain metabolic rate, and by the time we get down to the elephant on the far side, uh, that meta metabolic rate has decreased significantly. Now, if you're a statistician or a mathematician, you may look at that graph and think that looks a little bit familiar, that it looks like a fat-tailed distribution, and you'd be right. Because what we can do is we can actually put uh, this graph on a log, log scale, and when we do that, we get a straight line running all the way from the shrew through the human to the elephant. And if you're like me the first time you see this graph, it sort of blows you away. It tells us there's order to the metabolic rate of an animal and its body size. And if you get into the maths, you find this is called a power law. And this power law, as we said, covers a wide range of animal sizes. There's something about the systems that underpin these animals that produces these relationships. It produces a power law even between one of the smallest and, and one of the biggest animals that we've, we've got here. There's something in the system that's producing this. And it turns out that this power law relationship isn't just there for metabolic rate. It turns out that you get power laws, different power laws, but you get power laws for the body size of an animal versus the gestation period of its young. Um, you also get a power law for the body size of an animal versus its heartbeat. And you get power laws in a whole variety of different types of systems. For example, when you come to earthquakes, you can look at the magnitude of a certain earthquake and you can look at how often that earthquake occurs. You plot those on a log-log scale and you pretty much get a power law. In other words, earthquakes that have a really high magnitude don't happen that often, um, whereas uh, earthquakes with a low magnitude happen much more frequently and it largely follows this power loss. There's something about the system that generates earthquakes that produces this sort of behavior. We see it in city sizes. If we look at the cities in a country uh, by population and we work out, well, how many different types of cities do we have with, with, with a certain population and we plot them on a graph, we see we get more power laws. Um, larger cities occur less frequently than smaller cities and they are related by this power law relationship. Again, there's something about the systems by which 
cities grow in our countries that 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 follows this power law and we see it in a whole you know lots of other things we could talk about but one of the ones i find really interesting is language we can take in this case the english language we can take a, a certain extract from the english language in this case what we've actually done is we've taken the entirety of jane austen's pride and prejudice and you can count the words. There are 92,000 words in Pride and Prejudice, and you can rank them. You can say, how many times does the word the appear? How many times does the word and appear? And again, we can put these on a, on a log log scale, and what we find is we get a power law. That the common, the relationship with the words that most commonly appear and least commonly appear is a power law. And this I think is interesting because it tells us that in this diverse range of systems there are some commonalities that we see and one of them in these complex systems is this power law relationship and this is what complexity science really is all about it's about understanding the underlying natural laws of complex systems it's saying I don't care which branch of science the system exists in it's about saying is there common underlying natural laws that govern these systems and it turns out when we get to complex systems, there is. And the way to think about complex systems, and we're going to continuously unpack this as we, we go through the presentation, is that complex systems are all about the interactions. They're not about the components in the system, they're about how those components interact with one another. Because it's these interactions that produce patterns of relationships and it's these patterns of relationships that drive behavior that we don't necessarily expect to see in these systems like the power laws for example so this presentation is really all about understanding complex systems understanding that the interactions in these complex systems are the key to understanding them and digging deep into well what sort of relationships and patterns of relationships do we get as a set, as a consequence of these interactions but to really understand how this all fits together we have to take a step back and we have to go back to a tiny tiny piece in the story of science that will help explain why we think the way we think why complex systems thinking is actually sometimes very hard to get your head around and how to sort of free ourselves from the more traditional way of thinking to start thinking in terms of complex systems and the best place to really start this story is with someone we've already spoke about which is Isaac Newton because fundamentally he gave us Newtonian thinking and most of us think in a Newtonian way now what do we really mean by that well let's step through some of the key pieces that we're interested in in Newtonian thinking first one of these is equilibrium that systems operate in equilibrium, whether they're physical systems or whether they're something like the economy. We believe they operate in equilibrium. We believe we can pause them at any time and all the forces at play at that time will be in a really nice balance. But what if that's not the case for complex systems? The second thing we, we know from Newtonian thinking is systems are deterministic. We can write equations that govern the system and we can solve those equations usually and we can have predictable behavior. So as long as we have these equations and we have the initial conditions, we can predict what's going to happen in the Newtonian world. And this is where sometimes the Newtonian way of thinking is like it's the, the mechanical universe. It's a mechanical way of solving problems because we understand the system and we can predict. The third thing that I think is really important is we believe that you know, systems and a Newtonian way of thinking is causal. And we think about this in very much linear terms. There's a linear relationship between cause and effect. In other words, if we double the cause, we'll double the effect. If we have the cause, we'll have the effect. So we tend to think in these linear relationships between cause and effect. And we generally can tie effects back to their causes in Newtonian systems. We approach Newtonian thinking and this is probably the key thing from a reductionist perspective so what we do is we say and we've spoke about this already but we say to understand a system all you need to do is you need to take that system break it down to its component parts and once you understand how each of those components work we understand how the system works and once we understand how the system works we can predict what's going to happen. In other words, and another way of saying this is to say the system is the sum of its parts. And that's a key takeaway from Newtonian 
thinking. Once we understand the components, we understand the system. It's not just in science where Newtonian thinking has such a, a powerful hold. It has spread way beyond science. And again, this is the mechanical universe concept that once we understand the system, it's predictable, rational, measurable, and controllable. Now, one of the key things about Newtonian thinking is it is fantastic. It works incredibly well for so many systems. If you're going to design a building or if you're going to design an airplane, Newtonian thinking is the way to go. But there are some systems, and these are the complex systems, where Newtonian thinking doesn't work well. And it doesn't work well because of the focus on components and its reductionist approach. One of the key things here is that you can't understand complex systems by understanding the components in a deeper way. If we want to understand how an ant colony works, we can't do so by studying an individual ant more. There's a wonderful um, story, with, it's, I think, by Brian Archer, the economist, who tells it. He says, if you want to understand what's happening in your garden, you can't do so by catching every insect and every plant in your garden, chloroforming all the insects and pinning them to a board. It'll tell you a lot about the individual insects, but it will not tell you about how your garden works. And the reason why it won't tell you how your garden works is, as we've said, complex systems are all about the interactions. And by reducing systems in a Newtonian way and focusing on the components, what you're actually doing is discarding the interactions between those components. And as we know in complex systems, it's those interactions that actually are the key thing that we need to focus on. Okay, so if we can't use a Newtonian way of thinking to do that, what can we use? What sort of analytical tools can we get to? Well, they are two broad camps we can work in here, and both of them do really different things. One of them is called agent-based modeling, and the other is called machine learning. Now, you've probably heard about machine learning before. If you haven't, what machine learning really is all about is collecting a load of data on your system, putting all that data into a machine learning algorithm, and seeing if that algorithm can identify patterns in that data that are not obvious to you. Now, when we get into really good machine learning models, it can really dig deep and understand the patterns that are there and essentially the interactions that are there that are not evident to the, to the human eye at this point, and it can use this information for prediction. So if you've got really good data and a really good algorithm, you can predict in complex systems or systems what can happen next. The limitation of this sort of modeling, though, is that while it's really good for prediction, it is not very good for understanding. Uh, anyone who's used machine learning, and we use a lot of it and it works really, really well, is it's a black box. It'll basically say, yes, I've worked out the interactions in this system, but they're actually so complex I can't explain them to you in a simple way. But I know them and I can use that knowledge to predict. So with machine learning, we get the value of prediction without understanding. When we go to agent-based modeling, we get the opposite. We get understanding, but we don't get the ability to predict. So how do these agent-based models actually work? Well, what we do in agent-based modeling is quite different to what we do in most of the sort of scientific modeling. What we do is we say, well, let's put a set of agents out there, and we'll explain this in a lot more detail in a few minutes. And we know in complex systems, it's the interactions between the components or the agents that's the most important bit. So let's define in this agent-based model what those interactions are, and then let the agents then run around and do their thing, interact with each other, and then see what overall macro type behavior emerges from this. So it's really powerful in terms of understanding how changing different things or changing different interactions in the model will affect the outcome. The problem is it's not very good at prediction because what it'll actually tell you is it'll tell you is these are the sorts of outcomes you could expect for various parameters, but it won't, with a high degree of accuracy, say you're more likely to get one of these than the other. And that's because we see lots of um, complex things in complex systems like tipping points, and we'll come back to that again. But the value is these models allow you to understand what's driving the overall behavior in, in your system, and machine learning gives you a predictive ability. The two of these used together are incredibly powerful. 
We're going to park machine learning for the moment because a lot of people already know how to do that. Let's take another look at agent-based modeling and dig into it a little bit. And this is what I said at the beginning, that we're going to take a modeling approach to looking at complexity. So agent-based modeling, the best place to start if you're keen to start is with uh, net logos. This program is freely available. Go to the website, download it. What does it look like when you download it? Well, when you download it, you get this graphical interface, which is where your agents can go and, and do their interaction. And we'll come back to lots of models on that. You get sliders that you see on, on this uh, visual interface as well. So you can change the parameters of the agents or change how they interact from this point and see the effect that has on your model. Um, and then in the background, you get all the code. This is the code that defines the interactions in the model um, and, and drives everything. Now, if you're not into coding, that doesn't matter. Go ahead and download NetLogo. There's a lot of models in the model library, and you can get in and play with them and see how it works. And most of the models we're going to look at today come from the NetLogo uh, library. So this is how we go about trying to understand complex systems. So there's so much we could talk about in terms of this. Let's pick two or three of the key things. If I had to pick the key thing to learn about complex systems, it's the concept of emergence. So what is emergence? Well, emergence is when the components or agents of a system interact and produce behaviors that were not designed into the system. So in other words, we're going to go and define the interactions between the agents or the components in the system. But emergence is when the behavior that results can be quite different to what we actually programmed into the system. In other words, and one way of thinking about this is the system is more than the sum of their parts. And this is one way to, you can actually use to define complex systems, that they have emergence. They, have, they are more than the sum of their parts. And you remember that Newtonian systems are only the sum of the, sum of the parts. So that's quite a nice throwaway line. Complex systems are more than the sum of their parts. What does, it, what does that really mean? And at this point, your head should probably start to hurt, because emergence does hurt. And there's a really great quote by Don Farmer, a, a complexity scientist, who says, what does it really mean to say that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts? It's not magic, but to us humans, with our crude little human brains, it feels like magic. And this is one of the key things about emergence. As you look at some of these models and look at some of these outcomes, you'll go, I don't quite believe that. But that's one of the key things we see in complexity science. And really emergence is, you know, going back to Dine Farmer, somehow by constantly seeking mutual accommodation and self-consistency, groups of agents manage to transcend themselves and become something more. That's emergence. Okay, so let's look at this in practice. Because again, I think once you go to the models, this starts to become a whole lot easier. This is Thomas Schilling. And Thomas Schilling developed a model. I'm not going to tell you the name of that model at the moment. Um, but I want you to imagine this. What we're looking at in the grid is a city. In this city, there are 2,500 inhabitants or agents. They're pretty tightly packed. There's a few spaces. They're 50-50. We've got green agents and red agents. And what we're going to do when we run this model is we are going to set the slider on it, which is percentage similar wanted, which is currently sitting at 10%. And what we're going to do once we start running this model is that each agent on each time step in this model, each agent in that grid will work out what's the percentage of like colored agents around it. And if that is less than 10%, they will move. If it is 10% or more, they will stay. In other words, they're checking whether the neighbors are the same color as themselves. And what, what I want you to watch here is as we run the model and move from 10%, 20%, 30%, we're essentially increasing the need to have similar color agents around each agent. So let's look at what happens when we do that. Between each step, you'll see so we've around the 10% right now, and not much happened. You know, only 10% of the neighbors need to be the same color. Not many of them feel the need to move. So now we go to 20%, set it up, and go. And we see a few people moved around. Nothing very dramatic. Let's go to 30%. Go to 30%. And we run this, it starts to get a little bit more interesting. You're certainly starting to see patches of red, patches of green. But now go to 40% and watch what happens here. When you go to 
you suddenly get what we would describe as full-blown segregation. Now think about that for a moment. We only defined, the only interaction between the agents we defined was that they had to have a certain percentage of their immediate neighbors, their local, local neighbors, being of the same color. But once we hit 40%, where they only require a minimum of 40% to be the same color, we somehow get full-blown segregation. The segregation is emergence. In other words, we didn't design segregation into the model, but we ended up with segregation. And this is called Schilling's segregation model. Have a look at the bottom of the model that says percent similar. We've ended up with 82.5% similar people around them. You know, we only wanted 40%, we've got 82. So suddenly, the segregation is an emergent property of slowly ramping up the interactions. This is a key thing we see again and again. Once the interactions start working in these models, we start to see unexpected behavior. Our Newtonian brain should say we shouldn't get 70%, only about 40% of the agents should, should have similar. That's what we should end up with. We end up with a considerably higher number. Now, one of the criticisms that's often thrown as this these sort of models is but that's a ridiculous model sean you know that's that's a model in you know the con the, the issue of segregation is much more complex than setting something at 40 percent and the answer is yes it is segregation is, a, is an incredibly complex issue but what this model says is even with one rule one rule in place we still produce segregation and we're going to see this again and again so let's have a look at our our starlings you know what is driving this behavior? Well, this behavior, this flocking, is an emergent behavior. So if it's an emergent behavior, what interactions between the starlings do we think we would have to set to produce this emergent behavior? So we can build a model, and there's a model in NetLogo, and we can run the model, and this model basically takes just over 500 starlings, randomly puts them in this flight space, randomly uh, puts them in a certain direction and then sets them moving. And as you can see, there is no emergent behavior here. There's no interactions at the moment between each of these starlings. Now we're look, looking at a wrapped sky here. When they fly out on the left hand side, they're going to fly back in on the right hand side. Um, and what we can actually do is we can go and we can set a set of rules for these starlings. And this was done by a scientist named Reynolds, and he decided they would only have three rules. So the first of these rules is alignment. You know, um, a bird tends to turn so that it's moving in the same direction as nearby birds. Um, separation, if they're going to get too close, they'll avoid each other to, uh, to avoid um, impacting each other. And the last one is cohesion. A bird will move towards other nearby birds unless another bird is too close. Three simple rules. Now, the key thing about these rules, which are, are absolutely critical in this sort of modeling and in complex systems, is one, there's no overall person in charge. There's no central authority. And two, these are local rules. They're rules that govern the interaction of birds who are near other birds, not the group of birds as a whole. So let's plug these rules into a model. So in our model here at the moment, we've got the rules in, but when we set it running, you'll see the vision is set to zero patches. So these birds have the rules, but they have no ability to see one another at the moment. So here they go, flying around, and you'll see once we set the vision to five, where they start to see local birds in the vicinity, suddenly we start to see a change in the behavior. The birds start to care about what is happening around them. And we start to see what we would describe as flock-like behavior. And remember, this emergent behavior, this flocking, is only coming from those three simple rules. And we can put it together and look at real real birds, and I've sped it up on this bit to try and match the speed of, of the starlings in the left-hand side. But you can see this incredible similarity between the behavior we're seeing in the real starlings and in the model. And this emergent behavior, this flocking, comes from those simple rules. So emergence is probably the single most important thing we need to get our head around in complex systems. We will get behavior we didn't necessarily 
design into that system. And when we think about that, this behavior will be bottom up. It won't be top down. So it will organically grow and come up. It will produce patterns of relationships due to these interactions. And it's all about these relationships, not about the agents themselves. Emergence is a key aspect of complex systems. Another one is the concept of tipping. Now, in, in Newtonian terms, one of the key sort of Newtonian concepts is once we understand the overall equations driving a system, and once we understand um, the initial conditions in that system, that system will be very predictable, and it will keep doing the same thing. It will be this mechanical universe. What we see in complex systems is the phenomenon of tipping. Everything is very similar until suddenly it's different. So what's a good example of this tipping? Well, for me, one of the best examples is ice. Imagine we've got some ice. It's sitting at minus 5 degrees. And imagine we add 1 degree of temperature to that. We bring it from minus 5 to minus 4. We're still looking at a block of ice. We go from minus 4 to minus 3. We're still looking at ice. Minus 3 to minus 2. We're still looking at ice. And remember, we're going in increments of 1 degree at a time. We're linearly increasing the temperature. We go from minus 2 to minus 1, still ice. We go from minus 1 to 0, still ice. We go from 0 to 1, whoa, not ice anymore. Now it's water. Even though we've linearly increased the degrees, there's something about moving from 0 to 1 that produces a very different um, outcome than what we saw before. We go from ice to water. We've hit a tipping point, and we move into a different state. Just like the ice goes from a solid to a liquid, we see these tipping points in complex systems. Everything remains the same, everything looks quite lim linear until we hit a certain point and then suddenly we get different behavior. There's a whole range of examples we could use to show this. One of my favorites is this concept of forest fires. What we're looking at here is a forest and we are setting the density of the trees. In this case, we've set it to 10%, so every green dot is a tree. And what we're going to do is we're going to slowly ramp up the density of the trees from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, etc. As we're ramping this up, keep an eye on the left-hand side of the screen, because what we're going to do for each time we run this and press go, we're going to start a fire at the left-hand side of the, tree, of the screen. And those fire is going to move across the screen. Um, now, keep an eye in the beginning when we start running this. You'll, you'll all, you'll, if you blink, you'll miss the fire because the fire isn't moving very far from left to right. So let's just run this and see what's happening. So here we go, 10%, not much happened. So we go to 20%. Keep an eye along that, the, the left-hand side. It's a tiny fire, almost still can't see it. Let's go to 30%. So 10% 10 10 every time, nice linear increase. Oh, there, you can see a little bit more there once we get to 30%. 40%, we're definitely going to see a little bit more. You see the fire's penetrating a little bit from left to right. Again, only going up 10%. Let's go to 50%. A little bit more. But once we get to 60%, we've crossed the tipping point. And even though we've only linearly increased by 10%, just like we did every other time, because we've hit a tipping point, we're in a different state. Suddenly, the fire is running rampant. And I think with this model, it's reasonably obvious why the fire is running rampant. We have suddenly took all the agents in this model, or all the components, the trees in this model, and we have got them interacting with each other and interacting with properly. We've put them close enough together so they're interacting well. Watch what happens when we go another 5% to 65%. We're going half of what we usually did before. But again, because we're across that tipping point, we're getting a dramatically different result. We are basically burning the fire to right through the forest. So a really, really different result because we've hit that tipping point. Why do we get these sorts of tipping points? You know, in this case, we've burned over 94% of the forest. Well, the reason why is positive feedback. And this concept of positive feedback is something that I think we humans, we struggle with. And, and we struggle with because we're used to the Newtonian approach of you know, linear relationship between cause and effect. What positive feedback tells us is we can cheap, keep changing the causes until a certain point, and then we will get a very different effect. Imagine, and I think this is a pretty good example, imagine we decided we wanted to go and buy a holiday home on a certain part of the coast. 
And we go there and we buy one and so does other people and suddenly the price of holiday homes go up and other people go, oh, that's a good investment, buying a holiday home on the coast. And they go and they buy a holiday home as well and that increases the value again. And then other people say, wow, house prices are really, really good on the coast. That's a really good investment. Let's go and buy more and we keep buying more, which makes more people want to buy them. And that all looks great because we've got positive feedback reinforcing the view that these houses are increasing in value so suddenly we're getting a very different outcome and of course this all comes crashing down when too many people have bought too many houses and people try and sell houses and discover that they're not worth what they are and then we get a different type of positive feedback because what happens very very quickly is the house values collapse we get a very non-linear result in each direction and that's due to this positive feedback a key concept to understand why we get these tipping points so that's we've already talked about emergence that's tipping points let's talk and this is the last piece we'll talk about about self-organization complex systems are, are incredible at self-organizing themselves and i think you've seen that already with the the flocking of the birds very simple rules can produce very sophisticated behavior behavior that should seem random to us but is actually self-organized and therefore it's producing patterns and order where we don't necessarily expected. Now there's one piece of self-organization I think is worth talking about. Um, I really enjoy talking about this because I think it really helps us understand how complex systems can fail. And this is the concept of self-organized criticality. And this is basically saying, you know, the micro level agent behavior causes the system to self-organize and converge to a critical points at which small events can have big global impacts. So small events can have big global impacts. In other words, there is a non-linear relationship between cause and effect, a quite marked non-linear relationship. And that's because these systems have organized themselves to such a degree called self-organized criticality. Now, the first person to really popularize this and talk about this was a physicist by the name of Pierre Bach. And Pierre Bach did a load of research on self-organized criticality by looking at sand piles. Now, he didn't look at real sand piles. He looked at hypothetical sand piles inside of a computer program. We'll look at them in a moment. And he basically said, if I start randomly dropping sand on a table, over time, I'm going to build up little hills on this table. And in addition, and what's going to happen over time is as these hills build up, what you're going to see is you're going to see little avalanches as these hills get too steep. And what can actually happen is these avalanches will trigger other, other avalanches and other hills that are already perched in a very precarious state as well. So Pearback's view was that as we drop this, drop this sand on the table, the table is essentially organizing, or the sand is organizing itself into these sand piles. And it's organizing the sand piles into, you know, or bringing to the point where they've got self-organized criticality, where any more sand will cause a failure. Now, you've probably heard of this term where you get to this point, and it's called the edge of chaos. In other words, we've got a system that has a certain order and pattern to it, but at which, at this point, Suddenly, once we go after that, we get chaos. We get a chaotic type of behavior. In other words, complex systems often self-organize themselves right to the edge of chaos, after which we'll get failures. And I think, you know, I like to talk about this because it's a really good way of understanding failure. Um, the way to think of it is, is, well, what caused the avalanche? Well, usually what caused the avalanche is one grain of sand. But is it that one grain of sand's fault. After all, it's only one grain of sand. And of course, the answer is it's not that one grain of sand that's the problem. It's the fact that the, the, the sand has organized itself into a critical state. It's right on the edge of chaos. And it's that one piece of sand that simply is the straw that breaks the camel's back. So this very disproportionate relationship that we see in complex systems between cause and effect. A really simple cause can have a global impact. So let's have a look at one of these models. Um, again, we're in NetLogo, and if we press go on it, what we're going to do is we're going to drop randomly sand on the table. The dark blue is, is the sand when it's just dropped, and the lighter the dots means the higher the sand is building up at that particular point. Um, you can see how many grains we're dropping, and you'll see little blotches of red. 
and the little blotches of red in the table are the avalanches that are starting to occur. And as we look at these avalanches, you'll see they come in various sizes and they occur in random positions on the board. And the avalanches, you know, when we get to this stage of the model, as we're building up more and more sand, start to get bigger and bigger and bigger because as each individual avalanche happens, it triggers other avalanches and makes things work. So suddenly we see this disproportionate relationship between one drop of sand uh, can produce quite a big outcome. And the really interesting thing is we can run exactly the same as what you've seen, uh, but this time we can look at the avalanches. We can look at their lifetimes and we can look at the sizes they are when they occur. And if you're astute, you'll notice that we're plotting these avalanche lifetimes and sizes on a log log scale. And as we plot these on a log log scale, what you see is we start to get a straight line. We start to find a parallel relationship between the size of the avalanches. And this is just like the earthquakes we talked about earlier. Really big avalanches involving lots of grain of sands, lots, lots of grains of sands happen very infrequently where there are plenty of small, er, when, whereas there are plenty of small avalanches taking place. There's something in the system of how all these sand grains interact with one another, that they are self-organizing themselves into a way that when they start to fail, the way we see the failure occurring is following a power law. And this power law is the same type of power law that we saw in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and cities growing and earthquakes and the metabolic rate of animals. And what this is telling us is that there's an underlying nature in complex systems that is producing power law distributions. If we really get simplistic about it, what we're saying is unlike other systems where the interactions aren't that important or where we can you know, linearly superimpose them, we don't see the power laws. We get power laws in complex systems because the interactions between the components or agents of that system is producing a lot more complex behavior and resulting in power laws. Now, power laws aren't without controversy. There's views that they, we don't see them near as much as people think we see them. But as a general rule, where you see power laws, you can assume there's complexity going on because it's telling us there are un interactions between the agents in that system that we may not fully understand. There is positive feedback occurring. So how do you bring all this together? How do you change how you think about complex systems. Well, we've talked a lot about power laws and self-organized criticality and the edge of chaos and emergence and tipping points and, and self-organization. How do you bring it together? Well, I think for me, one of the best ways of bringing this together is an analogy with a forest. And there's been a whole bunch of studies done this in this in ecology and in complexity science. But if you think how a forest works and evolves, this really brings together a load of the themes that we've talked about today. So imagine for a moment we have a piece of ground outside and we're going to go and instantaneously create a forest. Imagine we dump every species of animal and plant in there and we basically let them fight it out. And what we're going to find in the beginning is you're going to have utter chaos as each individual species vies for their place in the system, shall we say, in the ecological system. They're trying to work out how they interact with everything else, how, what they eat, who eats them, how does it all come together. And as they trash th this out, they start to get self-organized, but they start to build relationships between one another, who eats whom, who eats what. The um, agents in that system who are not going to adapt as well die off. Some agents do very well, some don't. But they're self-organizing with mutual relationships between them. And as this starts to happen, the forest then starts to move into what we call a self-regulation phase. So this is, you know, on top of self-organization. Once it gets organized, it starts to self-regulate. And what it's doing is it's essentially rewarding the really good relationships even more, penalizing the bad relationships uh, even more. Essentially what we're saying is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The system at this point is what we would call as a peak 
efficiency. There's no waste in there and there's no redundancy in there either. Each of those agents in that system is interacting perfectly well with the other uh, agents in that system to produce a very tightly coupled system. Now, from this point forward, you're going to get what's called lock-in, which is really the negative side of self-organization and self-regulation. At this point, you are so locked into your relationships within this system that this is pretty much the only way the system can actually function. There is no other way for this system to function. It can't adapt any other way because it's too tightly coupled at this point. And then from this point forward, what happens at a certain point is we introduce uh, an invasive species or a disease comes in. But before we get to that, one thing that's really important about this lock-in self-regulation phase is it's very Newtonian. When we look at it, we can work out how everything's interaction. It actually interacting. It looks like we've got cause and effect relationships actually going on in here. And it's only when we introduce this new species or this new disease that we suddenly realize we're not in a Newtonian system anymore. We're in a complex system and we're in a system where relationships matter. Because what happens now is we take out one species. But because that species is so tightly coupled and related to the other species, that has a knock-on effect that flows right through the system that is the forest. It becomes incredibly brittle because it's so tightly coupled. And then we get collapse as the order that was there, the relationships that kept everything working fall away and we're back to chaos. And then what happens over time is we start to self-organize again. And this is how complex systems work, whether they're a forest, whether they're a business or a company, whether they're the economy whether they're socio-technical systems involving we humans and technology. This is how we work. Think of a new products come into the market, how that can collapse the market, make it chaotic for a while, and then everything comes back and self-organizes again. This is how we pull together all the aspects, in my mind, of a complexity. You can see the emergence in the self-organization and the self-regulation. You can see the tipping point when we get to collapse. You can see other tipping points even in self-organization where, where it looks like it could go either way and it tips one way instead of the other. And we see the self-organized criticality. The, the forest evolves to a lock-in stage where it's actually brittle and anything more will happen and collapse. And the problem is for us when we look at these systems, as we've already said, if we try and idealize this into a graph, and this is a silly graph, you know, when we're in the self-organization, self-regulation lock-in phase, it looks like this. It looks stable. And we, we feel we understand this system. We feel we can write the equations of it. And we see this in economics all the time. We sit down to actually write the equations of what's happening in the economy. And then suddenly something chaotic happens. And after that chaotic phase, we move back to the stable phase. The key for us to remember in these complex systems is that um, you, just when you're in that stable phase, don't assume it's going to be stable forever. Ask yourself, what are the interactions? How brittle are those interactions? What happens if something changes one of those interactions? Will we get a chaotic system or a different system for a period of time? Think about any problem you're trying to solve like this. What stage is the system in that you're working in? Because what you do in a self-organization phase versus a lock-in phase are really different. So if I had to try and pull all that together, you know, how should we think about complexity? The key thing is interactions matter. And remember that our Newtonian thinking, which is not just science, but has permeated management thinking and lots of other areas of how we think, tells us and teaches us that interactions don't really matter. It's the components that matter. And once we understand the components, we understand the system. It's very different in complex systems. My advice to you is if you think your system's complex, ask yourself, yes, there are the components, but what are the interactions I need to be aware of? Because these interactions will cause cause of organization and you'll see patterns of behavior as a result of it. Some of those patterns you'll be able to predict. Some of those patterns will be obvious. They'll be what's essentially designed into the systems. Some of those will be emergent. They will be the sum of the parts of the system. One area where we see this a lot is in safety and high hazard industries. You know, you want to make sure a site of your mine or your production plant is a safe site. 
Well, you can spend a lot of time working on the component part of your safety system or your safety component of your system, but the reality is the safety of your site is an emergent property. It's how that safety component interactions or is pressured or, or relates to production and all the other components of your business that will dictate how safe the site is overall. That's the emergent property. Um, we will see that the overall behavior of the system is bottom up. There's no central authority, so we don't need one person organizing this. It's bottom up and it will tend to be local and it'll be driven by local interactions between the agents. You'll have feedback, particularly you'll have positive feedback, and positive feedback can create tipping points and very dramatic changes in behavior. You'll see power laws, and power laws are just telling you that the interactions in your system are producing something that's a little different than what we get if you were able to linearly put them together and get mean distributions and that sort of stuff. It, and it tells you that in complex systems, events that you might think of are, are quite unlikely are actually more likely the, than you would think, like we see in earthquakes. We didn't even touch it, but many of these complex systems have adaptive interaction. In other words, the agents, due to the interactions around them, start to adapt and change, which then changes their interactions and the system slowly evolves and changes. Um, that really adds a whole other level of complexity to everything. And these systems don't necessarily go into equilibrium. They can look like they're in equilibrium for a period of time, but don't think of them in terms of equilibrium the way we would in Newtonian terms. Um, it's very dangerous to think about the economy as being in equilibrium. We know that when we get bubbles and bursts, that's not the, the economy in equilibrium. That's, the, that's the, the presence of positive or negative feedback. Nothing was in equilibrium in the forest. It just looked like there were certain stages that were. Which brings us right back to where we started. Let's go back to the game of life and Chris Langton on the sixth floor of the Massachusetts General Hospital looking at the behavior uh, and the patterns that were being produced due to the game of life. And while we got complex patterns that changed and repeated and we got randomness in here the rules as you're probably not surprised at this stage underlying this quite complex behavior are incredibly simple there are just four rules dictating what happens to a cell on the board in the game of life through each successive stages of its life loneliness overcrowding reproduction and stasis. Now what's incredible is, just like our birds flocking, these four rules produce incredibly interesting behavior. They produce a whole range of different patterns that we see in the game of life. And this has been studied for, for decades now, and people find new patterns that they didn't find before. And what is incredible is that while the, the underlying process that's taking place here is random, each time step, a different step here is going first. The order in which every cell is making their decision is different on each time step. What we see is that we still get patterns. We still get emergent behavior. It's unpredictable. We don't quite know where it will happen, but we will get behavior that we didn't necessarily design into the system. And the key bit is you don't have to have complex relationships to have very complex behavior. And the way to think about any complex system is to go back and say, what is the simplest interactions I can put in here between my agents and will I start to get emergent behavior like I'm seeing. Because in complex systems, interactions reinforce one another and result in behavior that is very different from the norm. The complex phenomena that arise in physical systems like earthquakes, floods and fires and social ones like stock market crashes, riots and traffic jams are decidedly not normal nor are the patterns that emerge as we see birds flock, fish school, and pedestrians follow sidewalks demarcated by invisible traffic lanes. We react, just like if we were walking on the sidewalk, to everyone else around us, and we self-organize in many cases without necessarily being told explicitly what to do. 
As John Hallen says, there is no master neuron in the brain, for example, nor is there any master cell within a developing embryo. If, if there is to be any coherent behavior in the system, it has to arise from competition and cooperation among the agents. I would say to finish our Newtonian thinking trains us that we can take a top-down approach to understanding systems and that we can understand sim systems by reducing them to their component parts. But by doing so, when we come to complex systems, we destroy the very thing that makes them complex. We remove the interactions between those components. And it's these interactions that really drive the behavior that we need to understand if we're truly to understand how a complex system is behaving. Thank you.